Subtext and Discourse. I'm your host, Michael Dooney, owner and director of Berlin-based contemporary art gallery Jarvis Dooney. A lot has happened in the last six months since this interview was recorded, details of which I'll discuss another time. So for now, let's go back to September 2018 for Berlin Art Week and the European Month of Photography. During that time, I spoke with conceptual artist Derek Kreckler, who was here for his exhibition at the Australian Embassy Germany. Our first collaboration was in 2016 during Berlin Gallery Weekend when we presented select works from his Accident and Process Touring Survey, which encompasses over 40 years of output. Following his exhibition during the European Month of Photography, we presented his 1978 experimental performance documentation Bicycle Race at Loop Barcelona. But before we dive into the interview, I want to read a brief summary of Derek's legacy from curator Hannah Matthews, who put together the survey exhibition that has been touring since 2015. Kreckler's works span performance, film, photography, installation, and video. He has regularly created tough, insistent imagery that has been at the critical edge of Australian art history and which has provided comment on our country's past, present, and future. The art of Derek Kreckler is often described as unsettling. Some have even referred to it as dangerous. Whether relishing the risk of experimentation and chance, or purposefully challenging our perceptions of country, identity and self, Kreckler's works flirt with an uncertainty that can prickle the neck. At the same time, they can open our eyes to the magic of how images are made, the murkiness of nationhood and its perpetuation, and the wonder of how powerful landscape can be. His works have much to share about art history, social relations, popular culture, and the environment. Kreckler offers conceptual and expressive forms that are commanding yet spacious, works that are sufficiently suggestive to allow us to generate worlds around them. So with all that in mind, let's hear the conversation. Okay, I found or came to your work rather through photography, mm. but your roots really are in um, your roots are in performance. Well, not entirely. I mean, I think initially it was painting. Yeah, you know, drawing and painting, which I still do. But um, that you know, painting is a discipline that requires a lot of time. So, and I found that I was more interested in immediacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and. Uh, I don't know if it was interest or stupidity, but I was more interested in immediacy. And when I say stupidity, it's not a negative. Mm-hmm. I like the idea that um, it's corrupting. At that point, I was very interested in corrupting things. Okay. And by that, I don't mean some kind of anarchy, but that I had a very um, uh, kind of almost OCD approach to things, and I was very careful with how I did things, and I just needed to break that because I knew I had to go sort of into a more, um, in a broader, broader field. Yeah. Because I, I just felt that, um, well, to be honest with you, painting at the time was um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, was, um, I didn't quite, I mean, I sort of understood it. I started to understand the Indigenous um, painting, particularly around the um, early 70s, mm-hmm. and found that to be, you know, a great fascination, but not something I could do. No. Um, and really, the dominant thing at the time was kind of colour field and, other sort of more um, abstract forms. Yeah. Um, it, because it, was there much overlap in Australia from what was happening in the US and in Europe? Because well, I guess in that period is when you had like the minimalists and those kind of guys. Yeah, well, the, the big thing was, and I think it's to the regret of Australian culture, <laughs> very unpopular to be saying this, but um, I'm sure, but the field mm-hmm. in, at the National Gallery of Victoria kind of concreted that painterly minimalism in mm-hmm. um, to the detriment of a few other forms, which I think, you know, was sort of too um, monocular, uh, whereas, uh, you know, conceptualism was a much more powerful force at that time, mm-hmm. although both were kind of receding and painting was coming back. Okay. Um, the new German expressionism from the 80s was, you know, and 70s really was um, starting to get a lot of strength and people were reintroducing the idea of painting. I mean, performance obviously still exists and all of the things we're talking about won't go away entirely. No, of course not. But um, it was more about sort of trends and uh, I think it's sort of people believe in something and because there's not a fresh breeze every now and again, they stick with it and it becomes a kind of dogma. I remember going to a conference in 84 in Sydney um, with Baudrillard called Mm -hmm. Future Fall and uh, on post-modernity and other things. And... uh, Someone in the audience took 
Budge Light the task because he was seemingly contradictory from an essay that he'd written two years earlier. And he just said, well, that was two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it struck me as obviously humorous, but at the same time, um, when people lay things out as a definite, you kind of have to worry about what that means, you know, like particularly in art because art's meant to be um, or should be an open field. It's not like we're dealing with national socialism or kind of a, you know, a, um, a type of art that services the government yeah. you know, or, or a particular persuasion philosophically. Mm-hmm. I mean, as soon as it does become attached to anything like that, it has a way of breaking it up. You know? and yeah. That's, that's the sort of thing I meant in terms of um, kind of just to sort of ruffle the water a bit in terms of my own way of expressing, which I wasn't sure about at the time. Yeah. So what age were you then? Uh, this was in the 60s well, that you started? Uh, well, um, yeah, I started painting uh, in the 60s. So I was around about, I don't know, 17, 18. Mm-hmm. Um, I had started earlier, but for various family reasons, I wasn't able to continue. I won't go there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's fairly draconian in Australia in the 50s and 60s. And the 60s were more like the 50s still, really. I mean, there was just this inkling of change. You know, the Beatles and music, obviously, sort of, you know, on the transistor you could hear music that was not of this place and that had um, a certain reassurance in it because it, it, it implied... Um, well, it was like, like, look, there's people out there that think like you do. You kind of go, that's great. You know, that's really important. But they're just not near you. Yeah. You know, they're not in the hood. So that either meant travel or, you know, whatever. But so I just wanted to all the time get out. So I, I found a great relief in surfing. I was able to surf from a very young age and because it was like physical. No fear of me being gay or anything. <laughs> so parentally it was an allowable instant, you know, I could do it. And as a... As, of course, you meet more people and more ideas and so forth, but still there was this deep dissatisfaction, uh, sort of an ex- ex- existential dissatisfaction, mm-hmm. which related much more to, uh, in hindsight, I can say a kind of combination of self and body and way of, you know, way of thinking and doing that was not latched to some of the dogmas that I, you know, that were around me in the culture at the time. Yeah. And, and family and all sorts of things, you know. I mean, Sydney, I think there was only a few places really then in Sydney that had the seeds of what Sydney's become now. The, the majority of it was backyards and suburban type approach and a very dogmatic form of conservatism. Oh, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm quite conservative, actually, and I believe in conservatism as a way of moving forward um, in a literal sense, like, you know, conserving what's around us and understanding what we do before we move forward. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just blocking any kind of approach to change because it might be bad. At high school, I had a very um, severe headmaster who, um, in fact, right up until that point, the cane was, and corporal punishment was quite normal. But then we ended up um, in my senior year with a woman who was head, uh, the secretary of the Australian Communist Party, um, who was the headmistress, and she changed it and became like a free school. And politicians were coming in and giving talks on ethics and so forth, instead of having to do religious studies. You know, you could still do that, of course, but that really became an eye-opener, you know. And then I started going to galleries, and um, I saw a piece by Brett Whiteley called Metamorphosis, and it really changed. I just thought, wow, anything's possible when you see this, you know. When I look at it now, I, I kind of find it a little bit um, I'm sort of disturbing that I liked it so much. Yeah. But but I still think it's a very valuable work. It's, it's more, um, I think it's more about me than Brett. And, and uh, so anyway, I, 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 that sort of started a flowering, mm-hmm. like, which I guess can best be described simply as a search, you know, like a sort of more, perhaps a more informed search than what I'd begun on earlier. Yeah. Mm. But then so you, like you kept down the path of that? I mean, I'm just trying to think, looking back at that time, obviously I'm of a different generation, but mm. was the kind of academic approach and the way that contemporary art is seen now that you go to university and then you need to follow a certain path mm. to get to that point? How was it then in that period? It was, okay, now you go to Sydney College or now you do this? I didn't know very much about art school at all. I, I actually ended up um, studying as a teacher um, because that seemed the right thing to do. And I thought it would ch- I'd be able to change the world. Um, you know, um, I'd studied um, and read independently 
Dissenovich and others, and also came to the sort of sense of um, uh, liberal ideas mm-hmm. in a conservative frame. And then I, I found this fellow called um, A.S. Neal, who um, had a free school in uh, England, and which had been converted from a borstal into a free school. And What's in a borstal? A borstal's um, like... Um, a school for bad children, okay. <laughs> people that break the law. Okay, yeah. and and he it was very fascinating to me, and I, it was utopian, um, you know, that you, you teach children responsibility, not you don't kind of hammer them for doing things wrong. You explain to them why it's wrong, and, mm-hmm. and for instance, if they break a window, you don't punish them; you just get them to pay for it. <laughs> it's that difference in logic. And that, you know, simply put, was really intra- you know intriguing for me because I, I had. Uh, a lot of the teachers I had in primary school and earlier, uh, a bit later rather, were refugees from World War Two. I mean by that not people from strangers to Australia, but people who were born here who came back sort of PTSD yeah. and were just witheringly stupid about behaviour. They didn't understand. If it wasn't ordered, it was wrong, you know. So they were too um, oppressive. So this was kind of a natural Outcome where I'd be seeking something that was open, and, you know, and, and based on um, individual strengths. So that that sort of search stopped quite quickly in my study because I realised it was just a you know kind of authoritarian system still. And uh, stupidly, I should have known that. But anyway, I just decided to leave teaching. So I walked out before I finished my degree, and um, which I was like five sixth of the way through. Mm-hmm. I'd been head of the student council. I you know I'd done all the stuff. But I just couldn't perceive how I could possibly fit in. And at that stage, I was, you know, 19, 20, 21, something like that. And so I just decided to go to the um, north, north of Australia, to the Great Barrier Reef and all that area, and, and do a bit of adventuring. And I was two years almost up there, mm-hmm. uh, working on fishing boats and seeing the rape and pillage of the environment in such a way that it was just shocking. I couldn't, because I'd had a lot of experience from surfing and snorkeling and so forth. And, being around the water as a very young child and none of it was unfamiliar to me. No. And it was in a, it was in a um, kind of yoga phase, so I was being very, you know, proper about what was right and wrong, probably you know, too much. But anyway, I saw some wonderful things, amazing things that I, I can never forget and some horrible things, you know, and, and survived cyclones and all sorts of stuff that um, I won't go into here, but really things that change your character, you know, that you see people like, you know, some people die, you know, it's like it's... Very powerful. Anyway, um, from the fishing boats, I wrote, no internet, I wrote, you know, which relied upon waiting a week to get to port and then the letter would go out and then you'd come back 40 days later and there'd be a letter maybe or not, and, you know. And uh, anyway, the South Australian School of Art um, replied and said, we've got a mid-term, mid-year intake, do you want to try out for it? Oh, so whilst you were working on the boats, you were applying to, yeah. to universities after, and to colleges? After a year and a half or so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, I went, I went down there and they took me in. And I'd written there because um, Sydney Ball was supposed to be teaching me, which he had been, but he'd left just before I arrived was two Englishmen who were conceptualists and uh, from London who were quite, you know, one had worked with Bridget Riley and, and um, taught David Hockney and people like that. And he was really smart and a kind of beautiful uh, painter. Mm-hmm. And the other guy was much younger and um, his name was George Popplewell. And he was much more kind of Brian Eno um, linked to early English conceptualism. You know, he was very um, poetic and minimal. And so it was a great combination. And the course was very strict and unlike now we'd have 120 intake and 40 would survive oh right okay yeah, and they would remove people if they were good at say design yeah they separated those people out and said you should go to a design school oh here. right okay and, and that was an independent school and i mean it was publicly funded but it was not connected to a university it was probably more i, I don't recall now but probably something connected with you know adult learning or TAFE or something, but it was an art school. It was yeah. called the South Australian School of Art. And is, it, is it still around? <clears throat> it is, but yeah. now it's part of the university. Okay. And which really is the reason why the telling is happening right now is that once they get into university, which was your original, mm-hmm. you know, it becomes something else. Class sizes, different sorts of economic um, rationales mm-hmm. and structures that it doesn't fit. It really doesn't fit. Yeah. Mm. They don't understand. Um, it's an expensive thing, you know, I think, particularly in the university. It's actually less expensive in an art school probably than what it is in a university because 
you know, the, the resources you need, if they're kept well and if you've got good staff, then it's a kind of ongoing thing because, I mean, some of the printing presses we had in Adelaide were, you know, 19th century and brilliant, you know. Yeah. Big old lithography stones and casting, you know, sculpture was huge and extraordinary um, in terms of resources. But in the university, the, budget, the way the budgeting works, it's a very kind of swift turnover and things have to be descaled at certain times because they don't want to have losses. Every student should have two square metres of space, you know. It's yeah, like, I guess it's a much more administrative the way that it's... Yeah, handled. it's a bureaucratic, um, you know, kind of jungle. And you can see how it works for VA courses or, you know, and so forth. And they have a really... really there's still a lot of politics and they have a, a difficulty understanding. Say, for instance, if you're in a science... Um, course they understand what a lab is Mm -hmm. so when you're talking to them about the need for a studio it's like you've got to go to a lab first so they kind of start to get an inkling and when you talk about some of the grading systems you talk about rhetoric and so forth in terms of the students um, dialogue and how like it needs to be history and so forth but there's also a lot of rhetorical stuff needs to be done yeah um and you know so you can reference law because that's also you know but rhetorically based but you're always, I have found, sort of justifying one thing with another rather than people just acknowledging what arts practice is. Yeah. You know, even statistically, you can find um, they, they tend to be run quite tight and well. But The universities or the colleges? The colleges yeah. within the universities. But, um, but they just, I don't know. They, I mean, I think there's a kind of still a hangover of... Um, the concept of greatness in, in art. Like, when I went to art school, I was told that, you know, two or three people wouldn't know if they were going to be any good until five years after they left, and the rest would do something else. But, of course, since then, there's been a huge um, rise in the arts industry. Yeah, certainly. And, and people are employed all over the place, and, and you know, they're happily employed. I mean, it's become an industry, like how music became an industry and fashion became an industry. Mm. It's population pressure as well, I think. You know, there's a, in capitalism, there's a place for everything if it can produce cash. In Australia, for instance, um, and there's a lot of statistical information about how it has been, um, the arts industry is a huge income earner mm-hmm. for tourism and all sorts of other things. Yeah, definitely. Mm. But anyway, none of that <laughs> is immediate and relating to the university art school structure. So they kind of tend to be bureaucratic traps and, mm-hmm. and uh, they're not well prepared to produce good artists and consequently they can turn around and say, well, we're not producing good artists. Yeah. Because you know, they're not investing in them properly in the first place, equipment. And- I guess back to your experience of going then. When you, so that was in Adelaide in South Australia where you went mm. and you applied as a painter or just as a general, I want to do art. Yeah, I took paintings. Yeah. That's what got me in. Mm-hmm. And it was a four-year course. The first year was a foundation year. And after that, you could apply to do the BA, the BFA. Well, actually, BVA it was at the time, Bachelor of Visual Arts. Of Visual Arts, okay. And you had to select a discipline in the, if you were going to do the, the Bachelor part. So they'd culled a lot of people prior to that. So about 40 people got into the first year. That went on. It was a really fascinating time and we were given fairly free hand but had like really tight workshops on, you know, how to do stuff, whether it was welding or whatever, you know. Or, uh, I'd skipped from painting to sculpture by then because sculpture enabled me to be a bit more open and free and I, I was intrigued by the concept of an installation. Very early on, I didn't quite know what it was. I put restrictions on myself as to what it could be and then performance as well. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm curious about, how you made the shift then from... Well, I mean, I didn't know actually that you were doing painting before, but then going from painting to sculpture. Because your earliest work that I've seen is... Yeah, it's heavily performance-based. Well, when I went teaching, teaching was like a, a case of going, look, I'm, I can't be an artist. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to get the support. <laughs> it just won't work. You yeah. Know? And and so I kind of put the brushes down, if you like, and then, then was, you know, for two years I was up in the golf carpentry doing other stuff. But I... Came back to Sydney, knocked up a couple of quick ones and set them down, mm-hmm. or went with them actually, and had the interview. And they said, "Oh, these are good." Uh, you know, and <clears throat> but once I got in, the whole world opened up because the foundation course was there were no disciplines, only um, phenomena like light. Oh wow! Or, okay, or, or um, something to do with you know the basic things that are in all media. Mm-hmm. You know? So um, it was really fascinating and. Um, 
I found I was very good at colour and a few other things, and and um, so I flew through it quite well. And then once I got into sculpture, it was like, what am I going to do? You know, what, what where are my ideas? So that this is where the universities don't want to come across. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like a six to eight month wait. You know, as a student kind of becomes a drunk or you know yeah. kind of <laughs> develops something. You know, and and or just you know working in a studio every day and try to understand how an idea and a concept might work. And I saw an exhibition in my second year, it was 78, Illusion and Reality, which was touring. A guy called John Stringer and Peter Timms did it. And it was um, mostly big heavyweights, solo wit and maybe 100 artists, and um, Joseph Kasuth and so forth. And, and to me, that was a breath of fresh air because I could see these different ways of working. At that time, too, I'd started to notice um, a very young uh, in Art and Mance Tiller's working as well. He, he was one of our lecturers for a while. And I really pr- liked what he was doing. And that actually came, went right back to my childhood because my dad worked in publishing. So I was sort of very first, you know, with postcards, I was pulling them apart and getting the thin layers off and seeing what loving things that didn't register properly. Yeah. And Mance was doing similar things. So that was quite a strong, oh, you can do that. You know, that's great. You know, like an ideas was sort of scanning through that way. Anyway, eventually, though, I, um, I decided on doing a performance. I just got jack of thinking. I studied photography there as well and then took some photographs, which were quite polite, you know, and, and um, kind of ethnographic almost of Adelaide desolation, mm-hmm. you know, empty empty industry areas and so forth. It was a bit of a um, recession at that point. Anyway, I decided to do a performance and I had kept on having Kasuth in my mind, which is this sort of one in sheet, three chairs things where you've got the chair, the picture of the chair and the text about the chair. And that triangle um, was really influential because I sort of understood that in terms of these are the components of thought. You know, so what if, and I tried very simple exercises of just looking for three things that I could interlock conceptually. And that sort of was the beginning of it. And the first work was, um, Wet dream, which um, was a kind of devotional action as much as anything else where I decided I'd just give myself to art and to do that I just went into the water you know it's like almost religious I suppose it wasn't intended to be but you know <laughs> baptism um, but um, solo baptism yeah. you know, baptising myself you know I had a suit on and uh, I went into the water and fell into the water so it was going to the ocean fall into the water and then do something with it and that third element was something I wasn't sure about and um, eventually I came across the idea of holding out a bed, filling it full of water and putting it into a gallery, getting into bed in the suit, you know, then getting out of the bed as far as the, the viewers were concerned, dripping wet and, you know, I had, it, there was slides and so forth related to the, to the fall, some sound and using lights and I then, the first time ever, I sort of thought about technology in a big way because I had a, there was an old Kodak um projector set up in Adelaide that I visited where they had 76 projectors pointing to a curved screen and a computer running um, which computer is probably a wrong word it was more like a some sort of early uh, analog computer where there's a patch matrix which basically just sent current to wherever mm-hmm. and, 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 a, and a sequence part of it so I had six projectors set up in three sections, so it's one, two, three, and each one had A and B projectors, so I could make a very long image and 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 cross fade in pixelation between them. So pixelation being an old term to describe yeah. animation. Yeah. So the waves were kind of going, eh, 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 you know, and then there was the bed, and the bed was, you know, I was rustling around the bed, getting wet, and it looked like I was doing something rather rude, and <laughs> people were laughing, and then the lights came on, I got up and sloughed off dripping wet and I had like 150 people 200 to 200 people like laughing with me and I thought that was great you know that was really a buzz and so that followed following on from that I did sound works and other things associated with parents and that was really satisfying for quite a long time in fact when I prior to leaving the art school I was invited to um, the um, Biennale of Sydney to put a work on art I, that was, you know, extreme given what I'd said earlier about, you know, three of us might get somewhere after five years. And, yeah. And so I felt um, probably less humble than I do now um, <laughs> and look forward to doing that. And, and had, um, But I remember that um, I got a reference from the head of department 
by the time I left the place, it had become part of a university. And so what, just for context of time, like how many three years? years. Oh, four years. Okay. Four years in the, in the institution, yeah. And what year was that? That was in the 70s still or...? Uh, yes, I graduated in 80, so it was a four-year degree. I started in 77, okay. so I graduated at the end of 80. And by, by late 79, we were part of the university. And I'd met um, Jim Allen from um, Sydney College who'd come down to do assessments, and both the and Mance had come down and studied uh, how it operated because they were setting up... Sydney College didn't exist at that point. Oh, right, yeah. okay. So they were coming down and looking what was going on there in terms of how to run a foundation course. Which are expensive. And one of the problems with an art school is if you don't run the foundation course and you're not producing good students, then you've got to have really good teachers to teach the foundation course. So money and the quality of the teachers is the big deal. That's the two, two hard parts. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, I got a letter of reference because I thought I might do something at Sydney College. I was asked, Jim Allen asked me to do an MA there. The reference Jim told me later just said that I'd been at the institution for four years and produced nothing. <laughs> With a smiley face next to it. Yeah. But those were the sort of days, you know, where it was all a bit tongue-in-cheek and, you know, probably excellent for uh, conceptual and, um, you know, experiential development, but perhaps not so good in terms of um, attitude of other people. Because mm-hmm. well, if you don't know what that means to not produce anything, like it's actually a bit of a gift, you know, like to not make an object is what he was saying, you know, so. Yeah. Because um, I mean, how was the general perception at the time towards the performance work and I guess that approach to art was, I mean, that it was kind of in its infancy then really, wasn't it? Um, or maybe in Australia it was kind of a new thing. Well, Mike Parr had been working for about probably eight years. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I was probably in the middle band. There was a couple of people who'd been working, not a lot, they are often seen to be the troublemakers and positioned in such a way that it made a broad statement at sort of like national shows that were, you know, because, I mean, obviously the curators were high, well, often, not all of them, but many of them were highly informed and wanted to reproduce um, situations that had good work in, the, like you might see in, uh, you know, Berlin or New York or somewhere. A lot of them had influence from England and America. So they'd had experience, you know, and they knew what they were doing. And some of these people were, you know, curators of state galleries and so forth. So they weren't shy people. Mm -hmm. They were were fostering a lot of that, bless their souls, you know. And um, there was, um, I think there was a thing called Act 3 in Canberra in 78 to 79, I was asked to go to that. It was peripheral to the main event, but that was okay. I was was still a student, you know, and I did bicycle race there, and that went down well. You know, Mike Parr had done a work there, which the first time I met him, actually, and um, it was um, been rowing around the lake uh, all night in sort of duration piece because only having one arm meant that he went around in circles. So, And, you know, he'd been picked up by the police and the police boat had visited him and stuff. So there was this kind of, you know, typically in his work, uh, a strong sense of humour plus um, this sense of uh, duration and the body, you know. And he spoke so well. I mean, he could have been a lawyer and uh, he just spoke really well and I was very attracted to, to me. And, but there were 10 artists there who were all doing performance. Benita Eli, mm-hmm. Eli, she started quite early. So I'm kind of much more – I mean, I came from that, but then because of Adelaide as well, one of the fallbacks, whilst it was a fantastic place to study, you're out of the network. So um, I just appeared out of nowhere, this yeah. guy, you know. So it was kind of like, you know, we'll, we'll give it time first, you know. I wouldn't, no, I mean, it was, wasn't was certainly compared to, say, the 1990s and, and early, uh, this millennia, performance was in its infancy. Yeah. And also it was strict, strict and casual. <laughs> it, it was strict in that it would refuse any theatricality, yeah. but casual in how it took place. Okay. So it, it could be a range of different things, but it had to um, not be um, theatre. It had not to be acting, which um, I still value, although um, more recently you'll see work and you kind of go, it would be best if they were good actors because it's too theatrical and they don't know the skill sets. Oh, yeah, okay. And, and it wasn't much until much later when I went and worked at West Australian Academy of Performing Arts that I learned to do appreciation for what actors do and what skills they do have. And it actually put me off performance. Oh, right. Yeah, because I, I was sort of like – I it reached a point where um, I think I was still holding on to it when really it had been – it had fallen away. I mean, Mike as well, you know, he said to me 
in the early, very early 90s, after I came back from New York, you know, you're going to have to, um, you know, draw, do something to sell because you can't just do performance. Although he wasn't saying don't because he still did performance. But I was kind of a bit against, you know, making things or having any objects. It didn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm going to Whopper and... Uh, so you, were in, you went to New York before you went to Western Australia? Yes, or? yes. I was at PS1 and um, for a 12-month period and made um, White Pointer there, the sound work, which then toured parts of Australia afterwards. And did the inaugural show at Art Space in Sydney in 1992. And it changed positions from being down near Central Station to Woolloomooloo, which was a nice thing to be in. Um, the way in which it operated, um, I think, uh, was that it, the, the whole field just opened right out. Mm-hmm. So performance was okay, any sort of performance. You know, performative became the big word. Ah, okay. Yeah. And performance art was dropped. The art part was dropped. It became performance. So oh, okay. you had, you know, because I mean, you have to credit the change being having some value because the, I mean, when you think about. Um, Say the Belgian ballet, uh, Bay de la Say, or, or, or Pina Bausch, or these other people who are working in more um, traditional um, dance and theatre concerns. Even um, Polish director Tadeusz Kantor, who um, I saw in Adelaide in like, 78, these were stunning performances that were outside of the norms of, the, of theatricality that I understood, or I think anybody, even in, in Australia at that time, understood. But from those experiences, um, the Worcester Group in America as well, they'd, in fact, they'd come directly from performance art and actions back in the 60s through to, um, you know, producing um, stage plays. Mm-hmm. And the, the stage play was like no other stage play we'd seen. You know, it was, had videos on the, on the not, not sort of for effect, but like some of the characters were on videos and performance artists working next to actors. Oh, wow, okay. You know, things like that. And... and very strange um, and unusual uh, material that sometimes, even if it was based on traditional plays, it would mm-hmm. just have this other angle. And you kind of you see how it just grew into this and actually changed theatre, you know, for the better. It yeah. changed, it got away from the, the standard mess on scene and more installation environment and so forth. And uh, uh, Peter Bausch particularly would work in very large open spaces, you know, without stages and. So that started to grow locally. So you had think groups like the Sydney Front and all these other sort of um, abs- more abstract theatre groups and, and, and performance art people moving into, you know, Buto, et cetera, coming into uh, performance context and dance and so forth. This is now kind of in the 80s um, and, and uh, becoming quite strong uh, uh, by the end of the 80s. But then it sort of died off in the 90s. But I talk about that because that's like the end of performance art in a sense. You know? So yeah. it becomes, now it becomes people with names like Mike doing stuff, you know, that's Mike Parr you know, rather than sort of a collective of performance. Um, I guess in the sense of kind of growing up. Is it kind of growing up to it? Yeah, I think so. Although some of the – but that would imply that some of the works – from that then and before were a bit uh, immature or premature, and I don't think that's the case. I mean, some of the performances from the 60s, uh, if you think about Marina Abramovic or some of the uh, Americans, uh, mm-hmm. you kind of, you know, they're still very startling works. And some of yeah. Chris Burden's works are quite profound, but weird. I mean, you know, how you nail yourself to a Volkswagen and get shot you know, or get, I ask my friend to shoot myself in the gallery, you know, shoot my arm. I mean, um, not that I think that's a great, they're great works, but, <laughs> but you kind of go, these are not unserious people and they're that's mad true. people, you know. And Mike, you know, um, doing stuff like chopping his arm off, you know, like, which was fake, of course, but the concept of shock, you know, but he, he like, he was strongly influenced by um, German and, and, and Austrian practice, you know, the Vienna action was and those people. Mm-hmm. So, but with a comical overtone. But he also phased it back into Australianness by labelling the works associated with different is- political issues. You know, like the most recent one, he uh, buried himself under um, one of the streets in Tasmania, Hobart, that was in some way related to Indigenous loss of Indigenous culture. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. Anyway, it, that became advertised that way, and that's the way it spread. So, you know, that's good. Yeah. You know, um, well, I mean, I guess if anything, it makes it 
not mainstream, but it makes it more accessible. I think it's sort of people mm. outside of that kind of community can mm. relate to it and at least access it and understand it mm. in a sense. I, sp- I suppose. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that has become a bit old-fashioned now insofar as more direct actions probably more useful for indigenous issues in australia and mm-hmm. support and what do what do the indigenous people want to do yeah exactly you know and they've made wonderful statements and they've been completely ignored you know so what do the the good the good inverted commas white folk do about that that sort of politics is much more important now i think so there was this kind of Melange of options, mm-hmm. yeah, and and so I just kept doing. I, mean, I did a lot of work at the Art Gallery of New South Wales through one of the curators there, Tony Bond. But going back to, so you were at what? How long were you at Wapa for? Just if you're thinking chronologically. So uh, chronologically, um, I'm before Wapa when I said what I just said. Like <laughs> I was back in Sydney by about eighty one, eighty two. I travelled to Berlin in eighty three. Went back and did a lot of work and a bit of part time teaching to keep myself going. A lot of performance stuff at the at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Then, then I decided I needed to travel, mm-hmm. and, and um, I applied to PS1 to get in, and then, then secondly applied to the Australia Council because I figured if I applied to the Australia Council first, they wouldn't let me get in. Don't know why. I just <laughs> felt like I was a bit of a nobody. And anyway, but I sent a brick from a work called How Does from a Tree wrapped and tagged through the post to PS1, and they loved that. It was like a conceptual artwork for them. I figured that would, you know, it's a bit strategic. And um, so they, they wanted me, and then the then Australia Council just went, you know, kind of so it folded in. Mm-hmm. And um, I went there for, for a year and a bit, about 14 months, and worked diligently there and met a lot of people, and, you know, and then produced this work, which I showed there, but also back in Sydney and then Melbourne and Perth, called um, White Pointer. You're listening to the sound of humans observing fish. <laughs> so this was a kind of performative thing for me, plus sound sound work. Oh, an installation, an installation. by the sounds of yeah, it. Yeah, and an installation. No, it's a sort of new sculpture, really. That, that was all good. And then um, I fell in love, and um, but I went to Perth to be with her, and she said you could stay as long as you get a job. <laughs> so um, I thought that was terrible. And, and the art was... Um, not open to me. I didn't understand what had been going on. They had this, they had this incredible history in Perth, which is quite – some of the artists are brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, but the scene was very closed and, and sort of had that typically uh, provincial attitude about strangers that, you know, kind of, you know, knowing more than they did and that yeah. was wrong. Blah, blah, blah. So the contrast is interesting then saying like when you went to Adelaide, that isolation was somehow beneficial, but then going to Perth, it was kind of like, who are these people <laughs> coming over and telling us what to do? Yes. Well, but, but don't forget, I mean, the, the Adelaide thing, I was a young student. Oh, okay. And yeah. by that time, I'd been to PS1. You know, I was ex- I had expectations that mm-hmm. I, my work would be shown, you know. And the only time I did show in Perth um, was out of Perth, really. So I got invited to – I did a residence. I did an exhibition at Kwangju in, in uh, South Korea, uh, which was called Inside – Window Inside Outside, which celebrated a terrible event there. And uh, that was um, in '88. 78, sorry, the event occurred and, and um, there'd been a lot of, it was civil war basically. So there were some really great artists there that I met and, and it was a fascinating time. And then I, I had a residency, uh, one of the first residencies in, um, in fact, it was the first residency with about six other people going to different parts of India called mm-hmm. Fire and Life. That was a real eye opener because it, they were going through this um, political sh- change over there, which was a lot to do with nationalism and so forth and, and the BJP party, and, and it really made me think about Australian nationalism. And, and, um, and I've always admired Sidney Nolan's work on that level, and, and um, that's how Blind Ned came about. Mm-hmm. But really, I didn't show in Perth um, until I'd been there like eight or nine years. Wow, okay. Mm, mm. There was nothing. I, well, I, it could have been exacerbated by the fact that Sarah was in charge, my partner was in charge of one of the main public spaces. Mm-hmm. Then I got talking to a, a very nice woman in Perth by the name of Margaret Moore who was doing a sort of, not quite, she wasn't a gallerist at that point, she was sort of more an agent and um, she started selling some of my work which outside of WA and in WA and then a couple of Biennales later we parted but that was fine but it was, you know, still great friends. But I mean, I think after India I had no time for the local scene in terms of its perturbations, just, you know, I was much more concerned about what I could do and where I could do it and how I'd do it. So I developed a lot more, um, a lot of writing about what to do. I was tempted to go back to painting, but I never did. 
but I certainly have since. Yeah. Because it's a comforting thing when you're an older person. I guess it's quite um, um, something you can control. meditative. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the paintings are, but um, it's it's a controllable entity. I mean, performance now. It's some, there's some very good people in in Sydney and Melbourne doing work. Young younger people. It's fascinating. And there was a period where I I felt it kind of went through that theatrical part, and and that as I said when I was in Wapper, I I kind of developed a great uh, affection for some of those people that were doing just acting because they were so, and dance because they were so physically and conceptually linked to it, and mm-hmm. they devoted and worked so hard. You know, they were serious. I was just thinking how I was introduced to you. It was through photography and through video. Was it more out of convenience that, okay, I'm doing these very temporal works. How can I keep a record of them and how can I transport them outside of the situation that they took place? No, I think it was more a case of um, doing these temporal works. How can I affect these other, or affect, first of all, to create an affect mm-hmm. with these other mediums? You know, well, why not take some shots? You know, why not take some photographs? And I... I went to Sydney and I was staying there because of something, I forgot what it was now, but and I stayed with some friends there who were avid photographers, Rosemary Lang and Jeff Clem, and um, I, um, Rosemary loaned me her Mamiya 66. And it was a great moment for me because I, I just found it so such a friend. Mm-hmm. And, um, and yeah, so in 2002, I think it was, um, I was grieving because of my the death of my father and I was down the south coast of Perth and I, I um, had that camera and I just it was a horrible day. Wind and breaks in the clouds with big shafts of light, which was nice. But I produced two, two for me, major works at that point. One of them was um, Holy, the Holy series, mm-hmm. to date five, five, five works. And also um, a piece called um, Untitled Moment, which um, based on my dad, but it, it was... I didn't quite know what to do first, but I, by the time that I'd taken those photographs, I knew I was going to be um, incising holes in the image and removing them and creating other forms because I had a, I had this little pond where I was living and there was a frog in it and it got eaten. And But I had some nice photos of it and I thought, oh, I was just sitting in front of the computer going, oh, you know, it's really terrible. I feel responsible because I hadn't put. I was supposed to put some rocks in to protect it, but this cooking yeah. arrow just. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, since then I put rocks in and protected the other frogs. But I had this fantastic shot of it sitting on a lily pad, and and it, you know because I knew it had been it was dead, I just figured I had to do something with the photograph, and I just cut a circle in it. That was it? You know, yeah. kind of, and just had this white circle, and I I kind of liked it. I'd always been aware of, you know, like Baldessari and those, and particularly. Um, often, you know, I, there, there aren't that many ideas in the world and, you know, often you overlap and you kind of then, as an artist, you have to try and avoid replication of somebody else's work. So I read up a lot about him so I wouldn't be taking any risks, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, because his idea was to draw your eye into the surface of the photograph and to create questions about the content. And my idea was to take your eye out of the photo, out of the two dimensions into the third dimension. Yeah. So it was, you know, it worked okay. And as I had not taken his idea, but sort of just coincidentally had my own version of it, even before I'd seen his work. Not that I had seen it by then, but earlier on, I'd been putting, blocking out people's eyes with for sale dots <laughs> and photographs and stuff. <laughs> just you know, because it was mad one night and want to do something. Yeah. And it, it amuses me. And I kept them, you know, and I had them there and I thought, oh, it's really cool. Um, maybe I'll do something with them one day and then saw Baldessari's work and thought, maybe I won't. And then, you know, so it's just that, it's that sort of um, almost on a school level, you know, like mm-hmm. it's not very serious, you just sort of do it and then... But I think with some of your other photography work, to say that you've not trained as a photographer in the classical sense, you still bring the same level of precision and I guess determination that's present in your other works to your photographic work. And I think like the big wave hunting for me really stands out because of how much historical reverence it has, but Mm. even the different processes and techniques that are involved, how it was printed and how it was made, Mm. like that you've layered negatives, but Mm. then you've also taken a digital image and then taken it back to the dark room for Mm. consistency. Mm. Who was the war photographer that you said was... If by, Jane Mortimer. Yeah, by overlaying a lot of images to create like a, a composite. Mm. Like you also incorporated. Well, he wasn't a war photographer, he was a uh, um, pictorialist. Okay. 
Yeah, he was he was English, and he he had, actually had he came to New South Wales at one stage, um, and has relatives there, and um, became head of the New South Wales Photographic Society at one stage. So there's a bit of work in the gallery. Yeah, that's how I sort of came to be with, to see him. But what he did for money was what you would now um, think of doing with. Um, Illustrator. Or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he, you know, he would basically do ads, you know, to, to get by. But he had this other thing of being a, a whiz with um, the technology. So he'd make his own paper, his own chemicals, and so forth. So brom oil and that sort of thing. I kind of get a giggle out of the fact that really, art photography, not not specialist and you know amazing photographs from the 1940s or wherever, or war photography or journalism, but. Where it's deployed in art really was sort of like the 60s, 70s. Yeah. You know? And then that was through people like Baldessari. I think there's a great photograph of him with a palm tree sticking out the top of his head, <laughs> which I think he silk screened onto a canvas and it says something like, don't take photographs like this. You know, yeah. Or, um, or wrong picture or something. Whereas the pictorialists back in um, Mortimer's time were trying to create these luminous two dimensional surfaces that were so. So pretty, they were honey and they, you know. I guess they were trying to paint with a photograph. I think, well, they probably were, but they're trying to create um, affect that is completely unwarranted now. It was, mm-hmm. it was more like Keats or Yeats. Completely romantic, you know. Yeah. And um, it just doesn't sit now. You know. But Mortimer, um, as I've told you before, I mean, he had this shot that his publicity shot that his nephew had done for him. I saw that photograph at the Arco of New South Wales and thought it was humorous. Mm-hmm. Knowing so much about the coastline and ocean, um, you know, in terms of experientially, um, I realised that he was in no danger whatsoever, but it was made to look like he, you know. I mean, it wasn't just him. It was also um, Stanley Brassen's essay on Jeff Wall. So there's a brief mention in that about pictorialism and, and he's a sort of negative about it, you know. So... Mm-hmm. But, and I understand why, because of that overly aestheticised format, you know, they were using. But because of that one particular picture of Mortimer's, mm-hmm. had, had I not seen that, I, would, I probably wouldn't have done it. But the idea that um, he produced so many photographs to create a cogent snapshot um, for nationalistic reasons, well, for money, I'm sure, um, for the government, for Times of London, called uh, The Gate of Goodbye. Really, that layering and Photoshop, Physically different, but the same thing in a sense. Obviously, skilled differently, but Walls know he's not simplistic in his use of those things. I mean, it's very complex, and they do, um, you know, he's got a lot of advances that we owe him for in terms of his experiments with photography mm-hmm. and technology and photography, particularly. The um, Dead Troops Talk image, I just, the two of them resonated. That is, Gator Goodbye and Dead Troops Talk resonated for me, plus the difference in opinion, and it just became a kind of interesting, a bit of an adventure conceptually for me to solve it for myself, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. That also relates to him with the image on the coast as well, because that also ties back into your performance work, because you're actually there on the edge of the water with the wave coming up. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate, really, because a lot of people think I risk. Uh, my life, you know, and I don't. I'm very careful and cautious, and that was well planned and organised. I mean, I know enough about the water. In fact, that place I didn't know that much about. It was a new place to me, but I spoke to locals and I spoke mm-hmm. to fishermen, and then I observed and understood. Then my own experience allowed me to do it, which effectively is the force going vertically and not horizontally. So, oh, okay. you know, you don't get destroyed. You know. But there's another um, a video I made called Decoy, which was also kind of people were a bit shocked at because it visibly shows people being smashed by waves. And Just thinking like working towards the end of the accident and process, I guess that was that series was also the title of your retrospective, which mm. kind of incorporates a lot it's of It's not a different. retrospective, it's a survey. <laughs> I'm not dead. Yeah. Okay, a survey yeah. over the last kind of four decades. Mm. But you're still, you're still obviously making work, aren't you? I think since the survey then was was made i mean a book is always a nice way to kind of draw a line on everything you've done before that mm. point mm. i mean how was that process having the tour and exhibition in australia like looking back on what you've done from the 70s up until now mm. how has that influenced you moving forward or how has that changed your perspective or how has it changed your approach rather are you creating new work and what you want to make and what you want to say now they're interesting questions there's many of them in that um <laughs> one at a time I'm, i've just started to 
go back to painting a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've also started to uh, become much more focused on um, the camera, no pun intended, but just really understand you know, the technology is so outstanding today um it's you know like it's almost like i want to go back to the mamiya 66 because i've just got three things to do you know focus aperture and shutter speed mm-hmm. and you click the button four things so it's kind of these guys the new cameras have just got so many other options and you don't want to use them automatically i mean i don't so it's almost like they're built to be used automatically mm-hmm. but they give you access at all these other levels and um you know, what does it mean when you've got 600 points of focus? I mean, I think it still functions just like a normal lens, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm just sort of interested in, in that. And I'm thinking of um, recycling a lot of cameras and just focusing on one that I, you know, think, anyway, that's just it's not, not interesting. But yeah, there's a kind of re- reassessment of photography I'm going through right now. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not a dropping of it. It's more a case of understanding uh, – because you'll see from the works. I mean, if you look at, say, Holy with its sort of sculptural qualities, um, then um, many a slip within the accident and process, which has you know, got performance within it and directed performance mm-hmm. and also um, big wave hunting where I'm actually performing. To me, there's still something a bit missing, and it's about objects and sculpture. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's, it's about space. And I think that's what I'm interested in. And I think by going back to painting a bit, it's kind of interesting to me because it creates a mark on the wall, you know, that's unlike a photograph. But if you put a photograph near it or an object near it, things start to sort of talk to each other. And that's no recipe, but it's it's kind of like it's an observation that I think, you know, triggers my uh, – it inspires me slightly, you know, like a, but then, of course, I need ideas why I'm doing something and – that's progressively become much more to do with material. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, I'm less likely now to sit down and think about a work in a kind of conceptual form where I then perform or act out the work. Much more interested now in finding some aspects within the materials I'm working with. So I'm finding I'm going back to studio more. I mean, even here, once <laughs> you've been in Berlin, you've been doing a lot of writing. It's an interesting thing. I kind of write... I have a very strange writing process. I kind of, it's almost like writing epithets. <laughs> Terrible, really. And then I'll do two pages of drawing. Yeah. You know, and that's more interesting. And, and it's more like just, I, I'd never present drawings particularly. I mean, it's just about keeping your hand eye in, you know, and sort of, I mean, I did a couple of this building across the way here, which is so boring, but there's a lot of detail in it, you know, so I kind of just start trying to work out how to show that detail and then modify the detail so that I'm not trying to draw every mark, which, you know, is a stupid thing. The camera camera will do that. So what is that gap between the two things? And also of late, I've been looking at a lot of them. One of the most, some of the most important painting and artworks really in Australia over the last 20 years have been um, Indigenous. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, whilst the traditional ones aren't, and, and contemporary traditional aren't, Excluded from that statement, I'm probably more focused on urban artists, yeah? just because you know they're working in um, European forms more. One, one, one in particular, Gordon Bennett, who um, I showed with a couple of times, and who also stole some of my work. Oh, like you know, ideas, yeah. Yeah. So, so for instance, have this one a tree. You know, after we worked together, I he, I came across an installation in in another state made by him that was not the same, but he used you know compressed newspaper bricks okay so it was kind of it, you know which was, according to his practice that's fine because like he's always he's a magpie he's unfortunately passed now but but he, he's, he was a magpie and beautiful work i mean he would um he was a telecom technician you know and um just became really famous because of his paintings you know? oh wow okay yeah, he's really cool and and um you know, he would just be constantly driven by the abuse of the culture on Indigenous, but always proud. So the work did not deal with um, tra- retracing every event that was negative. It was just beautiful painting and, and colourful and bright and strong and, you know, often with grids that you would see, um, you know, some like a historical photograph that might be dot screened on the painting or something that he would then put a grid over, but otherwise it would be a landscape. So you had the – and, you know, he was one of the first people to do that and, and, and really um, – Kind of, um, he and Amance Tillers, I think, were the two kind of more European style painters who, who, um, really pushed 
you know, a lot of indigenous uh, vibe into within to the sort of pain world of Australia. And yeah. then there's some obviously very good um, indigenous painters, you know, young, mostly males, and but some good women too um, in urban environments. So th- th- there's, I mean, I, ha- I have to pay attention to that, even though I don't particularly want to, yeah. because that's where I come from. You know, and that's the situation that's there. And obviously, I'm empathetic to the situation for them and, and wish things would change quicker. But as an artist, um, I probably should be somewhere else. And, you know, if I was younger, I, I, would, do, I would do that. I'd just get, get out of Australia. It's um, so far from everywhere. And I think, although, you know, it's all, it's a bit silly, really, because the way things are changing around planetary wise. I mean, it's kind of, it's interesting. Everybody's, there's a sort of unanimity, I think, in terms of everybody starting to see the same outcome and it's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's not like, I, I, you know, things are better in New York or something like that, although they may well be, but also it's got huge problems too. You know, everywhere has huge problems and the environment and so forth um, are really serious problems. And whilst I was talking about that in the 70s and 80s, I'm so bored that I've got to come back to that. You know, like you just, as an artist, you think, well, we'll deal with these things. We'll get them out of, you know, like it's a bit ideological. Oh, sorry, not idealistic. But you hope that things eventually will sort of move in a better direction. White Pointer, you know, is about, that's from the 90s. That was about and is about, you know, the oceans and how we treat them. And then in 88, uh, How to Discipline a Tree, which is about more, you know, land-based environments. A lot of the performance work, you um, had it, you know, it was indicative of what are we doing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but of course, it takes you a little while to realise you either need to give up art, pick up a, a weapon, or become a politician. Yeah, you know, because it's like unfortunately, when it's in the realm of art, it doesn't seem to have as much influence anymore. Although, um, on saying that, and this is one of the good things about Australian um, art scene, is that I think. The theatre and, and visual arts scene um, and performance arts scene in Australia in the last 10, 20 years, without the Indigenous content that's come forward since, I mean, it has changed the place. It's too difficult for, for the naysayers to get a, a leg up. Yeah. You know, there's like fantastic movies, you know, and Ivan Sen, or, or there's so many of them. But I mean, you know, you, you, you look at these movies and you kind of go, wow, this is, this is really on the mark. You know, and it's saying great things about the culture, like the indigenous culture, mm-hmm. and um, people are listening and looking, which is good. It's the more European side of the Australian story that's not functioning that well, which, you know, in a way, ought to be applauded. I hope you enjoyed the insight into Derek's practice and the small intro to recent Australian contemporary art history. There are some links below with more details about Derek's work. Thanks again for joining us. My name's Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.